We're glad that you've decided to listen to Living Word Dumaguete's sermon audio file. We're a gospel-centered evangelical church seeking to win the lost, to lead people to know and worship the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to obey the written Word of God, and to disciple the saints in Christ. Here's last Sunday's message, and we pray that it will minister to you. Let's open our Bible to John chapter 8. And let's read the Word of God together. John chapter 8. For this morning, let's pick up from uh, the last verse that we've studied last week. For this morning, we'll be studying verses 30 to 36. John 8, 30 to 36. If you are there, I request all of us to stand up and let's read the Word of God together. John 8, 30 to 36. At the count of three, let's read this. One, two, three, go. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The Son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving God, Lord, we are rejoicing in our hearts, O God, because of the grace that we receive from you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love, O Lord, for the strength for the sustenance, Lord. Thank you for your sustaining grace, O God. We are here this morning standing, fellowshipping with one another and calling to you because you are gracious. And Lord, I pray that as we study your word once again, you would make us see and understand our depravity, O God, our being sinful apart from you, and that, O Lord, we cannot do anything absolutely without your help. Lord, I pray that in response to the word that we will be hearing this morning, that there will truly be abiding among your people, abiding in your word, studying your word, deepening in it, and most importantly, O God, obedience and submission to it. Lord, thank you because your presence is with us this morning. And I pray, dear Father, that you will continue to make us understand this passage, Lord, because Left on our own, we, we cannot fathom the depths of your wondrous words, O God. We give you thanks and praise, Lord. I pray for attentiveness and may you protect us even as we study your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be seated in the presence of the Lord. The message this morning, I've entitled it, The Truth That Liberates. The Truth That Liberates. Now, as a nation, brothers and sisters, we Filipinos truly value our freedom. And I'm saying that because in our history, if you notice, for example, we read that our past leaders, they fought for our emancipation many years ago, so that on June 12, 1898, if, you're, uh, if you still remember your history, on June 12, 1898, the Philippines has proclaimed its independence from the Spanish regime under the Act of Declaration of Philippine Independence. And so we we so value, we so love our freedom as a nation that we even continue to reverberate the theme about our freedom as a nation through our national anthem. And a couple of stanzas from Lupang Hinirang in English version, it's called Land of the Morning. This is what it says. Land, dear holy, cradle of noble heroes, 
Never shall invaders trample thy sacred shore. Ever within thy skies and through thy clouds, and o'er the hills, o'er thy hills and and sea, do we behold the radiance feel the throb of glorious liberty. That's how we value our liberty, our emancipation, our freedom, and that's how precious this national freedom is to us. However, this morning, I'm not gonna talk about that because even though political freedom or national freedom, although it's a, it's a very wonderful thing, there's another kind of freedom that we should be more concerned as believers, that we should value more as disciples of Christ, as citizens not of this nation, but as citizens of heaven. And I'm referring to our spiritual freedom brothers and sisters. You see, spiritual freedom is even better, as I said, because it's, it's better than any other freedoms we have along with other liberties we enjoy. Because you can experience spiritual freedom no matter what sort of government you live under. Earlier, we, we prayed about North Korea, we prayed about Afghanistan, and it's, it's considered as the top two most difficult places for Christians to, to live in for 2020. And so it is possible for, for us to still live in spiritual freedom even if you're living in those two places. Because spiritual freedom is something that's not outward, it's not physical. It is something that the Lord has granted to us through His Holy Spirit. And the best thing about this spiritual freedom is that true spiritual freedom lasts forever. It lasts forever. And I'm very sure this morning all of us here wants to be free in the deepest and fullest sense. Let me repeat that. I believe all of us here this morning, we want to be free in the deepest and fullest sense. If the opposite of freedom is bondage and slavery, no one here among us wants that. No one wants to be enslaved. Nobody likes to be under any form of spiritual imprisonment or slavery, isn't it? Some of us may be enslaved to habits that are very pleasurable. And in that sense, I tell you, you love your slavery. But when you carefully consider and step back from the pleasures you get and consider happiness without that slavery, I believe you would like to end that bondage. You would like to be happy in freedom, fully happy, fully rejoicing, not a slave to pleasant addictions, wouldn't you? We all want to be free. And this is an urgent matter to all of us that you and I, I need to consider this morning because brothers and sisters, as we will see later, Jesus implies in our passage that a person who is enslaved to some sinful lifestyle, there's a big possibility for him that he is not a true disciple of Christ. And on the other hand, it is really an urgent matter because a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, is one who is continually obedient to the word of God, which leads to a true freedom giving knowledge of the truth. In our passage this morning, we will discover what lies behind man's spiritual slavery. And even better, brothers and sisters, we will also see what Jesus says about what we need to do in order to be spiritually free. What do every person, what should every person do in order to be to, to gain that spiritual freedom that we're saying. And the main theme that I would like to bring to us this morning is that you need to continue in the truth revealing word of Christ who alone can give you lasting spiritual freedom. We studied last Sunday that our Lord was locked in in a confrontation with his enemies, the Jews, the religious authorities, and he had proclaimed that he is the light of the world, implying that his opponents were in darkness. If you are not in Christ, you are living in darkness, no matter how good you think your life is. He had also warned the Jews that they were in danger of the fires of hell because they were from below, and Jesus is from above. There are two realms, two kingdoms that cannot be mixed, the kingdom of heaven versus the worldly kingdom controlled by Satan. But with that warning, we also understand last week that Jesus gives us or gives his audience, his listeners, a word of hope. And the very 
hinge the very theme of the passage last week that we we saw was that Jesus said unless you believe that I am he you will die in your sins John 8 verse 24 and as a result of that as a result of that teaching many indeed professed faith in him that's what we see here now beginning with our first verse this morning Jesus said as he spoke these things many came to believe in him now Remember, brothers and sisters, this is not the first time that Jesus received a response like this from his listeners. It's not his first time. In fact, if you go a few chapters before John chapter 8, we read in John chapter 2 that there are those who witness the miracles of Jesus. And John commented, John the writer commented, that those people believed in the name of Christ, professed faith in him, and yet Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew that their faith was not genuine. Also in John chapter 6, we, we read, we studied that there are actually some individuals, some individuals who walked already for a long time with Jesus. We, we do not know how long, maybe a few months, they followed him as disciples. And yet when they could not agree with some of the teachings of the Lord, what did they do? They quit being a disciple. They followed him. And that's where we read the beautiful passage wherein Jesus turned to his disciples. Would you also leave me? What did Peter say? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter and the rest, they, they stick with Jesus. They never leave him because they understood what it means to be a follower of Christ. Now here is where you can see, brothers and sisters, that initial profession of a person does not necessarily prove that he is a genuine Christian. To the Lord, initial decision does not really matter at all. Even if you would say today, I will follow Christ, that's not what it matters most. What's, what matters most is that you endure, and we will see that later. Some people can be in church for many months, many years, but when their faith are challenged, when there's a teaching that they could not agree with their pastor, or when they are hurt, they stop following the Lord, they stop going to church. And the most tragic thing that they would do, they give up on their faith altogether. And there's a great possibility that people like that, with that kind of attitude, have a bogus faith. Have a fake faith. And so the question that we need to ask this morning, what sets apart true faith from fake faith? How can we distinguish? How can we identify the false disciples? from the authentic ones. Jesus lays it down here for us. The next verse reads, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Where lies the difference? It is in the continuing. Our Lord clearly distinguishes between the genuine believers and those who only make outward professions, brothers and sisters. The difference between a real Christian from one who is not is the difference between those that continue and those that stop, those that persist in the word of Christ, and those that do not linger. The key word is the word continue. And continue in Greek is meno, it means to abide or to remain. If you are familiar with, with the book of John, you will know that Later in John 15, Jesus Christ dig deeper into this theme of abiding in Him. But here, He is saying, continue in my word, abide in my word. That's the proof that you are disciples. In short, brothers and sisters, perseverance is the mark of true faith. Perseverance is the mark of true faith. Perseverance is the mark of true faith for those who are real disciples of Christ. And you see, it's, it's easy enough to be superficially attracted to Jesus because of some miracles or physical or material blessings. It's easy to follow Christ even because of some encouraging or compelling words that we hear from Him. But how about if the Lord would remove the material, the physical blessings? How about when sickness, when trial comes? How about when, when the Word of God would say something that would challenge our belief and understanding, that would challenge us to reform our ways? Should we also desert Him? 
The real test whether our faith is genuine or not is in our abiding. That's what Jesus is saying here. It is only those who continue who are genuine disciples. A genuine believer remains, Jesus said, in my word. He said that. A genuine believer remains in my word. Meaning in Jesus in Jesus' logos, it refers to his whole teaching, not just some teachings. Did you remember what Jesus said to the disciples? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them some, what? Teaching them everything that I commanded you. It refers to the whole teaching of Christ. That's what it means remain in my word, not just some, not just the things that we like from the word of God, but the whole teaching of Christ. And such a person who obeys the word of Christ, who seeks to understand it better and finds it more precious, more powerful, especially when other teachings or other forces would oppose it. Such person is a disciple of Christ. It is the one who continues in the teaching of Christ who has both the Father and the Son. Hebrews 3.14 clarifies to us, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. It's not our initial grasp of God's word. It is holding fast, never letting go of it from beginning to the end. And the word of Christ here is referred to our assurance. We hold fast. We continue to believe. We continue to obey the word of Christ from beginning to the end. That's what every true disciple does. And let me just encourage you. It's not your grasping. It's not your holding. It's the grace and strength of God that will enable you to hold fast to his word. Revelation 2 verse 25, nevertheless, what you have, again, it did not specify here, but it's, it refers to the word of God. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. It did not say hold fast to your religion, hold fast to your tradition, hold fast what you have, hold fast to the word of God until I come, until Jesus Christ returns in the second coming. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end. To him, I will give authority over the nations. You see, we have here a future promise for God's people that in the end, God will reward us if we will keep, if we will remain in the word until he comes. Isn't that a wonderful promise from our Lord? When Jesus says, if you continue in my word, he said continually, he said there, then you are truly disciples of mine. Now, I'd like to clarify this. Do not misinterpret this as a condition of discipleship. No. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is that Jesus did not say, If you continue in my word, then you will be my disciples. No, Jesus did not say that. Rather, he said, If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Notice the difference? If you continue in, that, in the word of Christ, it does not mean that that's the only time you would become a disciple. No. If you continue, it is a proof that you are truly a disciple of Christ. Jesus is telling us here what true discipleship consists. That when a person abides in the word of Christ, then that person is a true disciple. It is a proof. It is a fruit of being a true disciple of Christ. He will not waver. He will not give up. He will remain in the word of Christ no matter how easy or difficult it would be for him at times. Especially in the matter of obedience to the word of Christ. And the very clear principle that we can understand from here is that when you abide in the word of Christ, it is a proof of your being a disciple of Jesus, not a condition to your becoming a disciple. Let me repeat that. When you abide in the word of Christ, it is a proof of your being already a disciple of Jesus, not a condition to your becoming a disciple of him. The disciples of Jesus have true delight and desire to continue reading, to continue understanding, to continue obeying the word of their master because the spirit of Christ is in them. It is the Holy Spirit 
that changes our hearts and give us new delights that we delight in the word of Christ. And when your faith is genuine, you will surely remain or persevere. Your faith holds tight to the teaching of Jesus and it certainly results into some glorious transformation in your life. That is why abiding in Christ's word, brothers and sisters, is the necessary step to real spiritual freedom. Because when you remain in the word of Christ, it leads you to the knowledge of truth. Why? What, what does the truth do? Jesus said here, verse 32, when you remain, the result, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful promise. Jesus tells us here of the basic truth. Continual immersion, meditation, submission to the word of Christ will result into the knowledge of truth. There's no other way that you would know the truth of the Lord apart from the word of God. The Lord chose to reveal himself through his word. And this is a promise. You will know the truth when you abide in the word as a disciple of Jesus. And any true disciple of the Lord will know the truth. Will know. It is a guarantee because the Lord promised it for us. You see, truth is the main theme of this passage starting in John 8 verse 32 onwards. And in fact, John repeated it or quoted Christ saying it seven times here. Truth is closely connected with the person of Christ. You remember John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So truth is closely connected with the person of Jesus. No Christ, no truth, and no truth apart from the person of Jesus. So that the knowledge of the truth is naturally associated also with being a disciple of Jesus. Because if you are a follower of your master, you're following his teaching. If he's teaching truth, you are also in the truth. Because what is true about Christ, he reveals, he communicates it through his word to his followers. And if we are regularly, daily meditating on the word of God, it is unlikely that we do not have the truth of Christ. The truth is not just some truths, but the truth. Did you notice that? And Jesus did not say, and you will know a truth. No. The truth, it is absolute, the truth, and this truth will set you free. The truth there is the truth of the gospel, the truth that is bound up with the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is the truth that has been revealed in Jesus and is revealed by Jesus. Do you understand? It's revealed by Jesus, it's revealed in the person of Jesus. This is the saving truth, the truth that saves people from darkness of sin. That is why Jesus says that this truth liberates. And again, he said, and the truth will make you what? Will make you free. Jesus says the truth will give freedom. Now, if you are given freedom, what's the assumption there? The assumption is that you do not have it. You're enslaved. So when he said it to the Jews, Jesus is saying the Jews are currently slaves. Anyone who does not abide in the word of Christ and therefore do not have the truth is bound. He is constrained. He is restricted. He is tied. He is under some spiritual shackles. In short, he is not free. He is under some form of spiritual slavery. Let me tell you this morning, if you do not have the truth of Christ, whether you know it or deny it, you are not in the truth. You do not have the truth of Christ. And so the question is, if the truth will make us free, what then? What then is enslaving a person who does not have the truth of Christ? Well, for one, very clearly in the context of our passage, it is Satan himself that enslaves the one who do not have the truth, who does not have the truth of Christ. John 8 verse 44 clarifies for us, you are of your father the devil. You see, he said it later on to these people. You are, you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the what? In the truth because there is no truth in him. And whenever he speaks a lie, that's the 
total opposite of the truth. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. It is the nature of the arch enemy of the Christians to lie. He is the author of all lies. Whenever he speaks lie, a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Very clearly, what enslaves us is Satan. This simply means that those who do not have spiritual freedom are under the shackles, the slavery, the bondage of Satan, brothers and sisters. And until a person does not become a disciple of Christ, abides in the word of Christ, and knows the truths of Christ, he will continue to remain as a slave to Satan. Secondly, another force that enslaves the person who does not have the truth of Christ aside from Satan himself is sin. And Dr. Luke records that Jesus saw the prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled in his ministry. He said, And the book of the prophet of Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and, and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, to those who are in prison. And clearly, Jesus is referring here to sinful captivity, to satanic captivity. This is the kind of freedom which John writes here. Men and women who do not have the truth of Christ are enslaved to sin. They are prisoners to their own unrighteousness. But the sad reality, listen to this, brothers and sisters. The sad reality is that people do not always usually realize that they are in bondage to Satan and sin. They tend to rest in some highly honored position of privilege, either positions in their job, national position, social position, religious position, whatever position that is, without being aware of their slavery. And that's what we observe here with the Jews. They were very proud of their religion and position. They were not aware of their need for spiritual freedom. That's why they retort toward Christ. It is marked, their retort was marked with pride. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? In other words, we do not need, we do not, we understand what you're saying, but we do not need that Christ. Tell it to anybody, but not us. Did you notice how proud these people are of their lineage? of their descent, of their bloodline. What they're saying is that we are Abraham's descendants and we have never yet been enslaved to anyone. Have they forgotten they were enslaved to Egypt? They were enslaved to some nations in the past and currently they were enslaved under the Roman government. But they deny that. That's on a literal and a political sense. But more so, they strongly deny their enslavement to anything or anyone. Because in their mind, how can we be considered slaves to anyone or anything when Abraham is our father? Literally, they're saying, we are from Abraham's seed. So the Jews saw themselves as having higher privilege than anybody. Thus, they are not enslaved because of the fact that they come from the line of Abraham. They have that strong sense of inherited privilege that they cannot acknowledge their own need for spiritual freedom. But you see, the Lord rebuked them one time. On one occasion, in Matthew 3 verse 9, Jesus said to them, Do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you, He's addressing the Pharisees here, I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Do not be confident that you are Jews yourselves. Do not be confident that you are among the tribes of Israel. Nobody is immune to spiritual slavery. Let me tell you that this morning, brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what is your race. It doesn't matter which family are you coming from, your lineage, your status in the society. It does not matter who your parents are or which church or denomination you belong to. It doesn't matter. Apart from Christ, we are all under spiritual enslavement to Satan and sin. Whether you are a Jew, a Filipino, an American, or whatever race you are in, 
No one is spiritually advantaged over anyone. All of us, apart from Christ, are spiritually enslaved. Whether you realize it, whether you know it, or whether you deny it. But the Jews, again, they, they are blinded to their own spiritual status. And so they say, how is it that you say you will become free? Abraham is our father. How is it that you say, Jesus, that you will become free? You see, they are very convinced that they are whole and therefore they need no physician. Just as they are here convinced that they are free and therefore they need no liberation, no freedom. And so Jesus Christ here comes, he rebuked them once again just as he did to them last week. So to correct their incorrect belief and to plainly reveal to them their spiritual status, Jesus clarifies what he meant by saying freedom and slavery. Verse 34 said, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you. Every time Jesus would say that, what he meant is that listen to what I say because this is very important. Truly, truly, I say unto you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Now, the literal original Greek to English translation of this is the one who does sin is the slave of sin. And what that means is that not only that the act of committing sin proves that a person is a slave to sin, but the very practice of sin actively enslaves a person. That simply means, brothers and sisters, that when a person commits sin, he shows that sin is his master and he is a slave to that sin. That's the reality. On the other hand, it also means and this is very important for us to understand is that every time you commit sin it actively enslaves you it wants you to submit to it because sin overpowers and the man committing sin is become weaker and weaker and weaker every time he commits that particular sin for those of us who are struggling in a particular sin in our life you would understand what i mean the first you give in, you can, you can easily make your way out. But the moment that you continue to give in yourself to it, you realize no matter how you pray, no matter how you read God's word, it's so difficult because the truth is you are being enslaved to it already. Sin has power. And every time we give in to it, we are actively enslaving ourselves to it. And so Jesus reveals that the ultimate bondage there is, is slavery to moral failure. The bondage to rebellion against the God who has made us. And that those who sin are slaves to their sin, whether they realize it or not, this means that they cannot break away from it. Are you aware that your sins has power? The power of hell is strengthening every sin that we commit. And such denial continues today, not just among the Jews. They, people today, a lot of us, we deny that we are enslaved. And although more than 2,000 years have passed already, there is still much confusion about spiritual slavery. People today do not accept the truth of their condition. If you tell somebody you are in a spiritual bondage or slavery, the person would most probably resist the idea. And the more enslaved he is, the more he may resent being told the truth. That's the reality. John Calvin rightly said, the greater the mass of vices anyone is buried under, the more fiercely and bombastically does he extol free will. Let me explain that to you by an example. Consider an alcoholic person. You tell him, hey, you're an alcoholic man. You're enslaved to that vice. You know what he would say? Me, an alcoholic, not me. I can stop anytime. Don't tell that to me. Or how about a person enslaved to sexual immorality? Perhaps he would say, 
I'm not like those who murder or those who would sell drugs. I hurt no one. So do not tell me that. I'm not under any slavery. People do not like to be told they are enslaved. And like the Jews, they are blinded to their true spiritual condition. Have you heard of, a, of an experiment involving a frog in a boiling pot? Anybody? Have you heard of that experiment? You see, if you place a frog in a pot of water and heat it gradually, maybe lower temperature first and then you increase it, increase it, increase it. You know what would happen? The frog will be boiled alive without resisting. Why? Because the body of the frog would slowly adapt to the heat. He does not know he died already. But if you let the frog jump into boiling water, a hot, a hot water already, of course it would resist. But if you gradually do um, increase the temperature, the frog will die. And he does not know it. The principle we can derive here from that experiment is very clear. The more a person would commit sin, the more he immerses himself in a worldly pattern of lifestyle. The more he becomes... In, the more he becomes also insensible to God's presence. And that's what sin does. You would wonder, Lord, why do I not feel you anymore? I'm not saying that we have to actively wonder if we feel the Lord. But you would know when your, press, when your prayers are, as, as they would call it, are only bouncing ceilings. But they do not reach. They, you, you cannot feel the the unction, the, the presence of God in your life. When you read God's word, it's like reading a novel or a book only. You would not hear the Lord speaking to you personally. Sin could rob us of our sensibilities, brothers and sisters. We see that in the life of Samson, a very gifted man of God. He had a Nazarite vow. The Lord told him not to cut his hair not to touch a, a dead body, not to drink any strong drink, but you know what? He violated everything. And even if the Lord had gifted him with, by, by conquering all his enemies and by doing great ventures for the Lord, he still did not mind the Lord. He did not even pray to God until one point in his life, what he did not realize is that the Lord left him. I'm not, saying if, I'm not saying that if you are a, a true believer, the Lord's presence will, will, will desert you. The Lord will leave you because the Bible reminds us that when the Holy Spirit comes, when you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you may not be filled all the time, but He will surely keep you to the end. But what I'm saying is your intimacy and fellowship with the Lord would be affected as a disciple of Christ if you keep giving in to a particular sin in your life because that's what sin does. It robs us of our sensibilities. And some of us, you may imagine you are going down the path of obtaining freedom as you begin to depart from God's word and go our own way. But in reality, let me tell you, we are about to enter the greatest bondage we have ever known if we will do that. And once you are in that sin, once you depart from the word of God, you could no longer listen to your family. In fact, you would start to resent brothers and sisters in Christ who would suggest to you that there is something wrong in your life. That, that's what sin dangerously does to us. And so what we need to realize, brothers and sisters, is that the path, the path to true spiritual freedom lies not in disobeying the word of God, but in obeying or submitting to it. You understand that? The path to true spiritual freedom, real freedom, lasting freedom, a freedom that provides joy and peace, lies in obeying the word of God, not in disobeying it. Sin enslaves, and everyone that, com that commits sin is a slave to it. That is why we should not minimize or trivialize the serious teaching of Christ about spiritual bondage in this passage, brothers and sisters. 
Do not take the besetting sins in your life lightly. Do not label them as merely an occasional making up of stories here. Ay, tingnan lang sila, wala kunak, no? Just tell them, just tell them kung ano, ang ka ng bumbay, no? O ang ka ng naningil sa utang, wala ko doon sa balay. Or maybe a simple giving or saying of white lie. Do not consider it a simple viewing of lustful materials. Do not consider it a friendly, malicious, and crude joking. No. Every act of sin enslaves. Do not consider it only an occasional burst of anger when we are not careful to mercilessly tear down our sin from us. It will enslave us. Confess it before the Lord and be resolved to repent of it. Ask even for the Lord to give you brokenness. If you do not feel that you want to divorce from that sin. You see, the effect of sin in our life is to take over in our heart the place of Jesus our Lord. So that we would, we would become slaves and sin becomes our master and we obey it instead of obeying the Lord. That's what sin does, brothers and sisters. That's how vicious sin is. You think that sin is friendly, enjoyable, you ha you are happy when you do it, but you know what? This is what Satan does. When you already gave in and you already fall, Satan would start also to tell you, "De, gain nanti kaganina." He would start to, to, to even cast doubts into our mind. And then comes the no assurance. Am I really a child of God? Every time you give in, you, you lose that assurance, brothers and sisters. And that's the number one effect of sin. You doubt yourself whether you really are a true child of God. Therefore, we must not tolerate even a little compromise that we spot in our life. And this is where the Jews have failed. This is what they did not grasp, the enslaving effect of sin. So that Jesus Christ made it even clear to them. He clarified his point even further by talking about the status of a slave. Verse 35 says, The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. Notice here, brothers and sisters, that Jesus uses two pictures side by side. One is the picture of the slave and the other is the son. And in context, what Jesus wants the Jews to understand is that they may think of themselves as sons of Abraham, but in reality, they are slaves to sin. That's what Jesus is saying here. As sons of Abraham, the Jews felt spiritually confident. In fact, they are self-assured. But Jesus now is telling them that they are but slaves and it should have stricken the root of their assurance. Because Jesus says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. In other words, ayaw kumpiansa dong dai. That you are an Israelite that you are in living word that you are going to the right church or to a church that speaks the truth of Christ do not be easy with your walk but in contrast Jesus then says the son does remain forever Jesus contrasts the status of the slave to the status of the son and the genuine son here let me remind us does not refer to us Christians. It refers to who? To Jesus Christ himself. The Son. Here's the picture that Christ would like to paint before the Jews. The Son is in the house and has access to everything. He can go wherever he wants to go. He can stay as long as he wants to stay. But the slave has no rights and the Jews are that slave. That's what he's saying. And here's the punchline of Christ. That if you are a slave to sin, the son's freedom are not yours. You do not have the privilege of Christ if you are enslaved to sin. Do you know what Jesus is doing here? He's tearing down the wrong belief of the Jews. Jesus is striking the self-assurance of the Jews that they are descendants of Abraham so that the wrong source of assurance would fall apart. And what he's doing is that he made them understand you are slaves, you're not sons, and they do not have the spiritual blessings of God. 
And Jesus is doing that in order to expose their true spiritual condition. Because once they realize that they do not have the assurance of going to heaven, of being right with God, they would have no other option but to trust the Son. That's the purpose of Christ, supposedly. They would trust the Son who alone can rescue them and release them from their spiritual bondage to sin. And you know what? Then and there we have a principle that we can apply. This is how you should present the gospel also. Do not just merely present the good news about Christ. Tell the person, you need to point out first to the person that he is enslaved to sin. And then provide the message of freedom that the gospel of Christ offers. That's what we do every time we share the gospel. Because how can a person understand oh, what good news is for? If they do not understand the bad news, what am I saved for or saved from? And so Jesus adds, as he teared down the assurance, the self-assurance of the Jews, verse 36 says, So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed because you are enslaved. Christ the Son is the one who enjoys freedom above all and he is the one who gives us that freedom. The freedom we enjoy is the freedom that Christ enjoys, the freedom which when he gives to a person, he describes that person as free indeed. Dili lang free partially, 50%. 50% of your life, you commit it to the Lord. 50% you commit it for sin, for Satan. No, you are free indeed. Those whom Jesus liberates from the tyranny of sin are really free. Now let me clarify what does being free mean. Does that mean being able to do anything and everything that we want? By no means, brothers and sisters. Because to be free indeed is to have freedom to rise above our sins. How can you who are already freed from sin be enslaved to it again? Freedom to live a holy life, freedom that we never had before, the freedom to choose the right, the freedom to choose the best, the freedom to keep on growing, the freedom to be all the more sanctified in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be free indeed. And Romans 8 verse 2 clarifies for us, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. The Lord has freed you. Do not give back to the slavery of sin. Galatians 5 verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. A.I. Carson rightly comments that true freedom is not the liberty to do anything we please, but the liberty to do what we ought. And it is genuine liberty because doing it is doing what we ought now to do as it pleases us and the Lord. That's the kind of freedom that the Lord Jesus himself alone could give. It is a freedom that starts from the moment we put our trust in him. A freedom that liberates us both from the judgment of sin and the reign of sin in our life. A freedom that he continually gives even as we abide in his word. And a spiritual freedom that comes only through the truth. You see, the true evidence whether we are true disciples of Christ is not in our initial confession to follow Him. But in our commitment to continue on to remain in the Word of God. Because anyone, any person can follow Jesus for a day. But a genuine believer will follow Him for a lifetime. He or she will hold tightly to the words of Christ and never let go. The question for us this morning, are you remaining in the word of your Savior, of your Lord? Are you filling up your mind daily with the word of God? Is your life dominated by the word of Christ? That every area of your life is under the control of Christ's words. You see, remaining in Christ's words involves two things. You study the word and you obey the word. Let every thought, every deed and action seeks conformity to the scriptures. And you know what? Sometimes there are things that you don't like from the Bible. Even if 
You need to still obey. Asking God to change your heart so that the truth of the Bible will find a warm and friendly welcome in us. The word of God is the means God has chosen to reveal himself to us. And through the Bible, we grow in our understanding and worship of him. Therefore, remain in it. Hold on to the teachings of Christ and never let go. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Seek to understand God's word. Grow in it. Meditate it. And most importantly, listen to this. Obey it. Amen? Obey it. Obedience is our highest response to God's word. Because the reason most Christians today are not experiencing spiritual freedom is that while they may be biblically literate, they are not biblically obedient. Are you obedient to Christ's word? We best abide in the word not only by reading it, but by obeying it. And the word of God is very clear from cover to cover so that we need to constantly contact with it in order to grow both in our understanding and obedience. And as you grow, the Lord reminds us today that you will know the knowledge of the word. That's how you also know the truth. The longer you persevere in it, the clearer the truth becomes. The deeper your grasp of the freedom-giving gospel of Christ Jesus becomes. All of us must be students of the word. Not only your pastors, not only the preachers, not only your leaders, not just the disciples themselves, not only the educated, but all believers of all walks of life. You need to be students of the word of God because all of us also need the liberating truth of Christ's word. Amen. All of us need spiritual freedom and full freedom because we still have besetting sins. We still have struggles that we need to overcome. And there is only one of these two words that describe us best. We are either slave or free. And perhaps some of you this morning, you have not entered into the initial freedom of being delivered from sin. That initial deliverance comes from acknowledging our bondage and the power of Christ to deliver us and from personally receiving Christ by faith and repentance. For the rest of us, you may find that even though you have been already liberated initially, but still when you look at your life, the word slave or bondage seems best to describe you where you are today spiritually. Are you like that? Is that still our feeling about ourselves? That may be because you have returned to your old ways. And so you have become desensitized just like that frog. You have become desensitized and you no longer sense the, the presence and the power of God in your life. It's gone. What we need to do is to repent and to turn from God. 1 John 1 9 clarifies to us if you confess your sin, He is faithful and just to forgive you. But not just to forgive you, but to cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. It is by faith that we are enabled to turn back to God and become people of His Word. Let me ask you again the series of questions that I asked earlier Are you abiding in the Word? Are you feeding yourself on it? Are you obeying it? Those are the questions that will provide us true spiritual freedom, enduring spiritual liberation. May the Lord God establish these truths in our hearts. Let's bow down our heads in prayers. Lord, what a wonderful promise we have received from you this morning. Whom the Son sets free, he is free indeed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because majority of us, we have experienced that. We know 
what true freedom means, O oh God. We know what spiritual freedom means. It is the freedom to worship you, to honor you, to serve you, to be rejoicing in your word, in submission and obedience to your word, to delight in you, to worship you as our King, as our Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I pray, O oh God, that for those who are here this morning, who have not yet experienced initially the spiritual freedom that you want your people to experience, you want them to experience, I pray, show them your grace and mercy. Save them, O God. Save those whom you will save, O God. I pray, Lord, quicken their hearts that they may realize how spiritually enslaved they are to sin and to Satan, O God. Lord, I know that Satan is blinding the eyes of those who are not in you, those who are not your disciples, so that they would not be able to see the light of the world. But I pray, Father, in that impossibility, what seems impossible to man, it is all possible in you, O God. Release them from the bondage of sin. Release them from the captivity of our arch enemy. Lord, because you are stronger, O God, and you are stronger indeed. Lord, I pray but as we continue, Lord, to serve you, may we indeed serve you in all freedom. Ground us in your truth. Make us abide in your truth. Give us new delights, new desires, O God, to meditate and to obey your word. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise this morning. All the glory belongs to you because of your reminder, of your rebuke, of even teaching us. What really spiritual freedom means, O oh God. Lord, thank you for the freedom that we have in you. It surpasses all kinds of freedom and liberty. And the true freedom, O oh God, is in living a holy life for our Lord. We give you glory and honor, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand for our last song. I'm 
sanctify your people and lead us so that we would value the freedom that we have in you a freedom so that we will not go back to the yoke of slavery once more but the freedom to choose to worship you and serve you gladly oh god we give you praise we give you thanks lord for whatever you have accomplished in our midst this morning and lord we also thank you because we can offer to you our tithes our grace gifts our offering use this money lord in order to continue to do your work work of preaching work of evangelism of discipleship all the things that we do for your glory and your honor in jesus name we pray amen and amen we may now go with the love of the lord <laughs> 